Greetings and salutations to our fine podcast audience. Ed, Nathan, how's everybody doing? We're good. doing good. Doing, doing good. good. It's cool. a dreary day. I was about we're to say the same thing. Today. I was about to say the same thing. Yeah. A little dreary. I don't know where how it is for you, but where you dreary. are when you're actually watching this. But I will say the flowers are blooming at the time that we're filming this, and it's yes. nice to have nice to have flowers. My there's a, there's uh, the trees not on my property, but next to my yard are blooming and. It's nice to get to go outside every day and get and to see some flowers. breathe in the pollen. Yeah, true. In well, Georgia. no, because, see, wearing my mask. Well, that does I help. wear my mask even at my own house. I go outside, put my own mask on, go outside. I'm telling you, I have not had the allergy problems hmm. that, I had, that I have had uh, my entire life. Wow. March through May is always terrible. Then July through November are terrible. Uh, so we'll put that down as good things the pandemic has done. Yeah, yes. I'm just saying. I, and I have not been as sick this year as I have been the rest of I'm well, a I, sickly I, person. I was going to tell you. Thing. Let's talk about good things good the things. pandemic. Well, I was going to say, I did just read an article recently. We have virtually in our country eliminated the flu. Mm. That's awesome. That's and, right. and they, they've compared. I saw a comparison of how many flu cases we had this time last year versus now, and it was minuscule, statistically minuscule. And that was the, the comment that the scientist said. He said, we have virtually done away with the flu this year. We don't even have a flu season. Air quality around the world has gotten better. Air quality has gotten less better. driving has taken place. I've seen those pictures from, like, I think it's L.A., where they have the pictures of where the smog was. Yep. And now right. you, things are much clearer in, in places like L.A. I, I, I haven't driven into Atlanta in a while, but I hear that traffic is amazing. Yeah, oh. it's much better. We went. Um, I was off work last week, and we we went twice up to Atlanta. And I wouldn't call it amazing. It's still Atlanta, but it's comparatively. Better. It's comparatively, amazing. it is yeah. better than it than it had been because we went. We know, were also loud last week and had to drive on two eighty five going north and coming back. Really, not even in prime times, and it was still two eighty five. A pain when yeah. you got up by the stadium. Mm. Yeah, we were we were at the zoo one day, so we had to come back through downtown at lunchtime, and it was busy. But it isn't those times. I mean, we've all been in Atlanta before where at 1230, you're in a parking lot. Yeah, that's right. On absolutely. 85. So it wasn't that, but it was still – it still was enough that my wife was, oh, uh, oh, oh. Uh. <laughs> my time wife have to now, do when we drive in any of those kind of situations, because we've had enough of those tense conversations <laughs> for 40 years – she just leans her chair back and closes her eyes. Oh, go. boy. I'm going to write that down. <laughs> she yeah. just goes, this is not going to be good for either of us. Uh, I'm going to lean my chair back. and You just go to sleep, honey. Yeah, she just doesn't need to see what's happening. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, really, nothing's ever happening. Well, All brake lights, no matter where they are on the highway, are a signal to Becky that danger is ahead. Hmm. They could be a mile in front. Is that a wife thing? If she can see a brake light... I I'm, think I'm not trying to be. I'm not trying to be. You know, I'm not trying to make a statement about all women, but I will say that that has been a also a feature of my it's marriage. Like I will say. I'll say this. It's not. I. I have a very very good friend that I give a hard time. He normally. He can't ride with anyone. Uh huh. Mm. I do know. I do have a couple guy friends that are that way. Okay. It's a control issue. Control in issue. my yeah. opinion. Because yeah. I don't mind. Riding with anybody, but everybody says, oh, I hate riding. Well, he says that. And I have had other people. I don't like riding with you. Well, I know I'm aggressive. I know mm -hmm. that. Yep. But I don't mind riding with you no matter what. Mm. Yeah. Hmm. My goes. wife doesn't like driving in Atlanta either. The whole the sure. whole thing makes her nervous. So. Becky also it. doesn't like driving, yes. but she doesn't like riding. No, she doesn't like that. She likes that. Pro well, I don't know. She probably likes that better because I think she trusts me more than she trusts herself. But mm -hmm. either one, she doesn't like. Atlanta traffic makes her yeah. – interstate traffic, I think, in general makes I her I will nervous. say this, since my wife doesn't listen to this, my favorite thing in our whole marriage about driving has been uh, Becky doesn't see well at night. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so she's terrified – all the time at night because she thinks I have the same vision. She has. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. I can't see, therefore you can't see. Yes, because <laughs> everything is what I see. <laughs> exactly. So is that it? Anything else good come out of the pandemic? People don't just randomly feel the need don't to touch, touch me. I, yeah. I like that as well. They do not feel that, one, I want to either touch hands with you or hug you or any of those things. <laughs> they all feel the need. Is it okay? And, you know, if you give me warning, it probably is okay. Sure. 
But you like the warning. I like the warning that I got to have permission. Hmm. I will say this, and I know this, I guess, makes me part of the, 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 the problem for certain groups of people. I guess on the other side, people do. I really enjoy wearing a mask, and at times I wonder, maybe I'll just continue wearing a mask. And well, I'll tell you why. For me and my personality, is I don't ever have to think about what my face is doing. Uh, I often have yeah. a lot of time I've where I'm in conversation too. with yeah. people that I go, oh, I need to make sure I'm, 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 like I'm not making a weird face or I'm not sending a signal to them that I, I'm mad about what they said or that. And you really can't tell a lot from a person's mm-hmm. eyes. Mm-hmm. And so I, uh, I wear my mask and I, don't, I feel way more comfortable in conversations with people because I don't hmm. feel the need to be fake smiling as... I do with many of you so when you come and speak to me. when people say to you, eyes are the window of the soul, you're like... Turns out it's that. not because not you so think much. I'm very interested and I'm not. Because yeah. uh, what yeah. I've heard from most people is... Because I, I can see this. A lot of people will think... Because I can tell by the way that I'm... Uh, they respond to something. They think I'm laughing or smiling at what they said, and I am not. <laughs> you thought that I found it was very funny, I guess because of something in my eyes... Just kind of shake your head. You just kind of, if I just sit and do that, you don't know what's going on. Mm-hmm. So we yeah. should play that as a game sometime. I put the mask on. Yeah. You try and guess what what's happening underneath the mask. Hmm. I've thing. had people tell me that's. I think I think I can tell you're smiling under the mask. They're trying to figure it out. I can promise you, I'm not. Yeah, because I'm because <laughs> you're never smiling. I'm almost never smiling. If if I don't if I if 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 I'm not like I'm on camera right now, there's a lot of there's a lot of just background in my brain. Like you should look interested and you should smile and you should you're in, <laughs> be a be. A, my wife calls it my robot brain. She's like <laughs> you you decided at some point you're you're at a funeral, Nathan. You should not be smiling. And I'm, should, I'm the guy that people are always like. I know you were thinking this about me, and I'm like. <laughs> I'm not thinking about you were assuming I was thinking because <laughs> no, I wasn't. He's on the other side of the equation, which is he is often laughing in inappropriate times, oh, yeah. and no one knows why I he's laughing. I am the guy that's often you will do something you didn't intend to be funny, and I go, oh, that was hilarious. <laughs> yes. no. uh, I, I'm just telling you, people fall down. Mm, that's always at. funny to me. I understand that. And I, and I then do have the thought, oh, I hope they aren't hurt. After I laugh. Yeah. Sure. Including me. When I fall down, it's funny. <laughs> yes. Yes. I have to remind my I have four girls and I have to remind them that constantly. It's okay when your sisters laugh when you fall. That's just a part of life is that people, when yeah. you fall, it's going to be funny. If you break something, then we can deal with it afterwards. But I probably will laugh the first time you fall. One of my favorite pe- persons at this church, people, persons, oh, whatever, Lord. whatever that right word is, uh, is a lady named Kelly. And she and I share that, that you could fall and there might be blood and we would be laughing and yeah. then help you. Yeah, mm-hmm. we're going to help you. Mm-hmm. Anyway. It's amazing where our conversations go when we start on something totally <laughs> unrelated. Is that a 45 minute? Is that the end of the podcast? <laughs> I got eight minutes on my timer. <laughs> While Joel is shaking his head and saying that should be the end of the podcast. So, <laughs> so people have completely tuned out now. Yes. So Who we'll knows? This is probably this is probably the crap people actually really care Maybe. about. And then we're going to answer some questions, some deep theological question about salvation, and they'll be like, "Get back to the thing about yeah. laughing when people Just fall and ramble." Yeah, we are going to get a little theological, I think, today. <laughs> okay, I, I think there's a very simple question that we're going to answer today. Um, simple in the fact that it, it's it's pretty straightforward, but I think it's going to lead us into a bigger conversation. Oh, good. Yeah. So buckle up, everybody. <laughs> That's right. Uh, the bigger conversation being, this is a question surrounding prayer, which we talked about a lot on this podcast. I, I've noticed a lot of people have questions about that, so we keep getting questions about prayer. Um, so we'll probably get into the nature of prayer today, but here's the specific question. Are y'all ready? I think. I guess. You better be. It's been a big preamble. Because I'm reading this. Here we go. It is. It sounds dangerous. Yeah, it's all scary. <laughs> scary. We the people. All right. Sorry. So this person says, I, I pray for immediate uh, household, my circle of friends, and then I widen it some to pray for church leaders, political leaders, people that have asked me to specifically pray for them. Uh, and they use an example of the uh, some people they obviously know who are in AA, struggling with addiction, and all this kind of stuff. Um, then they say, uh, but I'm not able to pray for all of them. My list is getting really long. Okay. So the question is, uh, I start to feel guilty because I don't pray for all of these people that I feel like I should pray for. Is it okay to just say a mass prayer? Like God, I pray for all of those people and you just kind of lump them in. And then their question is, how do you draw the line and not feel guilty when you don't pray for everyone? (laughs) 
It's you laughing. Think, it's laughing. Inappropriate. But it, that's it's not inappropriate. inappropriate. I will continue the rest of the podcast with my mask <laughs> on. I'm sorry for laughing. I don't have to. Okay, have Nathan has his thought, mask and on. I'm sorry if the, I didn't mean to laugh. I'm not laughing at the question. I'm laughing at some thoughts behind it. That in because I also have thoughts like this. Yes, I think yeah. everybody does. I have all of the thoughts the person has. Yes. Even though I know. I shouldn't have those thoughts because right. I know enough to know the thoughts aren't right. right. Yeah, and that's why I think... But I, I still have them. Yes, and but that's why I, th- I said I think we should get into uh, t- talking about the nature of prayer um, because this signals, if, if this is really something that you are worried about, then it tells you something about how you see prayer. Right, and not only how you see prayer, but how you see anything that you have in a relationship. It's almost... Um, it's almost how you see God and mm. what we do and how it impacts God. Every time you turn something into that I can do something that might m- manipulate God in mm-hmm. some way, and then if I don't do it, I manipulated it for some people but not for other people. Therefore, I'm the reason they didn't get it and other people did get it. You. And I feel those things, too, so yes. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying you have misunderstood what's actually going on with, yeah. like, with I'll give the God an, Jesus said we could call Father. Yes. Like, i give you an example. I had heard for years some people that, of course, are way more spiritual than me because they would talk about things like, I prayed for my children every day for 50 years, right. you know, and every day I was on my knees begging God on behalf of my children. And I would hear things like that, and I would think, I'm a really crappy dad. <laughs> yeah, me too. Because I, I have not done that. I, I admit I have not every single day by name called my children before God and, and pleaded on their behalf for whatever. No. Nope. Um, but at the same time, that is, like you said, is it, a, it is assuming that God is going to somehow bless that person's children in ways that he just couldn't bless mine because I didn't do what that person did. And that's, it's somehow I have to make intercession on people's behalf because God doesn't want already what's best for that person without me saying it. Right. Mm-hmm. And that somehow... If I say it and you say it and 80 other people say it, it will somehow make something happen. Mm. Mm-hmm. That's not what prayer is about. So maybe we should now talk about what prayer is about since yeah. we've gone really far. Well, on what it's and, not and about. to be clear, and, and, I, and I always like to point people back to when Jesus uh, in the Sermon on the Mount was discussing this topic. And he was talking about, you know, when you pray, don't use all these lots of words and mm. don't do it in public. And then his reason for that is because your heavenly Father knows what you need before you ask him, Mm -hmm. which we all grind down to that very issue Mm -hmm. when we think about prayer. We all go, well, if God already knows, then why should I pray? And Mm -hmm. I think that was part of Jesus' brilliance as he was saying, exactly. So maybe you're thinking about prayer in a way that is a little bit off. Maybe you should change the way you think of prayer. Mm -hmm. It is not a... Uh, list of things to get God to do as, as if He didn't already know what to do. Like which you just doesn't said. mean I shouldn't bring up to God the things no, I'm concerned about. That's I right. Should the last few weeks I've been the online host for our online worship, and uh, we pray with each other. We've been praying live with each other, and one of the ways that I've talked about it has been God does know what we need, but like any good father, mm-hmm. I often, when my kids, particularly when my kids were young, I knew most of the things that they were thinking and feeling because I've been in that place before. I know what it's like as a, a child to wonder about mm-hmm. when's Christmas coming or wh- when my friend, when am I going to get, you know, the things that might concern them, that might worry them, that might trouble them. But it's a special relationship when the kid decides to trust a parent enough to talk to the parent about those things. Yes. Mm-hmm. And it is a form of love to the parent mm-hmm. that the kid decides to say those things mm-hmm. to the parent. Not that the parent needs, 
Not that the parent didn't already want the best for the kid and yeah. wasn't doing everything they could to help the kid in those instances, mm -hmm. but the kid needs to say it, and the parent loves hearing it, mm -hmm. loves mm -hmm. being involved in it, and it moves the heart of the parent for, toward the child. And as, as much as or more than what you just described it for me, when in those times when I have prayed for, for things and brought that before my Heavenly Father, it opens my heart and mind up to see his working in the world right. more than when I wasn't talking about those things to him or bringing those up. I, not that he answered when I said it and he wasn't going to answer it when I didn't, but that my heart and my spirit is more attuned to what he's doing in the world, and therefore I see God in ways that I never would have had I not prayed. Yeah, I mean, does that I make think, sense? Yeah, I mean, it does. I mean, because ultimately, what God has always desired since the beginning is a cooperational relationship with human beings, and we miss that. Um, even many of our theological statements mm -hmm. miss that. That mm. God created a people to cooperate with. He didn't just, he, he created us for the sake of loving us, but his loving nature uh, requires him to, to not use us, but to cooperate with us, to, to say, so he creates the world with, you know, an Adam and Eve in, in, the, in the garden, and he says, here, I want you to rule over this, you will have dominion over this, but by rule and dominion isn't the way that I was always kind of taught of, it. and so now it's yours, just blow it up if you want to blow it up. <laughs> what he's saying is, is, hey, I want to work with this, this is a garden, we're going to work together in this garden of, of creating and making new things. And there's and, a part you'll do and a part I'll do. Yeah, yeah there's a part that you're, you play, there's a part that I play, and so there's a part of that which is prayer is just part of that cooperational relationship with God, which is there's, there's, there is a thing of God knows what I need. So I'm not even coming necessarily with needs because when Jesus says this, I think it's great. There are certain times like um, Paul says, like pray without ceasing, which is a, a command to pray. But really, that's all under this assumption that Jesus says, which is when you pray. Mm -hmm. Jesus is saying, you are praying. Everything you do is a prayer. Right. And we mm -hmm. have this weird way of viewing it, which is there's, and I, I've now just begun doing this. I, I don't believe there is anything supernatural. I believe everything is supernatural. Mm -hmm. We split our world into there's these natural parts that science can explain. And God really has nothing to do with that. That's just the natural part. <laughs> and then there's these things God has to do with it. I remember hearing someone once say, it's just because we can explain how lightning happens and ancient people would have believed God was behind it, but now we know God isn't behind it. Just because I can explain it doesn't mean God's still not behind every lightning strike. Right. Well, it's like I heard a, a scientist on a, a show one time talking about the the actual existence of the universe, and he was explaining matter and antimatter and all this scientific stuff, and he went through this whole explanation, and he said, so based on science, we should not be here. He said, we still don't yet understand why we're here. Right. He says, we know we are, but we don't know exactly. He said it shouldn't happen. And and without saying it, what he was saying is it's all a miracle. Right. right. It's, it is supernatural. Back it to is, your point. It is also. And well, there's just not this. There's just not this break that that heaven and earth are not s separated in God's mind. They're separated in the sense that we do not allow heaven to be on earth, which is why Jesus tells us to yeah. pray, "May your kingdom, kingdom come, come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven." That Jesus is the first person who exists in both planes at the same time. He's able to be fully with God because he is God and be fully human. And he says, I'm inviting you into a way of being, a way of being where you operate in this world, but you see your father at work at all times. And so really the reason that I pray, and I mean, Dallas Willard's the one who says this, I'm just talking about my, what me and my father are doing together with my father. And so people come up, mm -hmm. right? Because yep. in my day to day, I know I'm going to work that day, and I'm going to interact with some people. So, God, would you bless them? Would you make me a blessing to them? Mm -hmm. Would you help me to see how I can do things? But would you do things behind the scenes that I can't even do? My children are going to be a part of my day. Would you do that? And, I mean, I know we're commanded to pray for political leaders. I don't pray for political leaders every day, but there are days when there are things going on in our world yep. that I know— God, I have no, I have no influence on what happens. With us. Would you do something? Would you bring wisdom? And so, I don't even know that. Often, what I'm praying for is, God, would you do something you wouldn't do? But God, you invited me. You invited me to get to be a part of your kingdom coming into this world. So, as one of your servants, let me tell you what's on my heart. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you what's in here. And sometimes, God responds. 
And he starts changing my heart, and I hear what he's up to. And I do believe, as you said, it moves the heart of God. I think there are times that God hears what I have to say, and God might have gone, you know, that wasn't even a priority for me today. Not that it's against what he would have done. <laughs> no. yeah. But he goes, you know what? I think that's a great thing. We do see that in the scriptures, that there are times oh, yeah. that people pray, and God goes, huh. Okay. Like, certainly there are people who interact with Jesus, and Jesus goes, there it says, Jesus was amazed. And another mm-hmm. word to say amazed is shocked. Mm-hmm. Jesus goes, didn't see that coming. Like, whoa, that's interesting. Which, that is part of this interest. First, because for some people, when you say things like that, that is this, mm-mm, that's not God. Well, that's the beauty of who Jesus is. Jesus opens our eyes to seeing, oh, there's a lot about God we don't fully understand Well, and let's yet. be clear. Everything that we see that we have been revealed to uh, about God um, is God condescending to us. Yes. yes. And so just because that seems too far to condescend doesn't make it any less of a condescension. I'm, I know yes. that sounds con- I know yes. that sounds confusing. God is stooping to yes. our level. Having In every a moment, everything we know, everything, everything we know has yes. stooped to our level. So just just for you to say that that happened and Jesus experienced that, we feel oh that's a little too low. It's well, undignified for God. It, yeah, to feel it's that all way. low. Come on, man, it's yes. all low. He's coming down for us. So and it's a misunderstanding on our part as well to think that everything we know and has been revealed to us is everything that is. Oh, yes. Yeah. That there's not That's an immensity arrogant. that mm. hasn't been revealed to us. I, one of the statements that Dallas made that I'll never forget is he said, you have to remember invisible things are real. Mm-hmm. Mm. And I have prayer is often hard for me because I'm talking to invisible, but invisible Oh, yeah. Invisible is real. And we've had a year of something that's invisible affecting our whole world. Yes. yes. It is very real. I got and COVID. It was invisible, but it kicked my tail. <laughs> it was real. Well, <laughs> and the funny thing to me is a hundred a hundred years ago, when germ, you know, understanding germs wasn't really a, a thing, people would have told you, hey, oh, come on, man. It's mm-hmm. not, there's, no, there's no virus out there. Doing, but we know invisible mm-hmm. things are real. Mm-hmm. Just because I can't see them, and now we can see that on a micro, uh, microscope. For a hundred hundred years ago, we couldn't. There are other invisible things happening yes. that we can't see and don't even know about, and don't, don't even don't even have about. a foggiest clue about. Well, and I think when we think about prayer, there's a lot of. I think the reason we get a lot of questions is because it's so mysterious, mm-hmm. and because it comes from basic misunderstandings of God, misunderstandings of ourselves. Sometimes we are trying to control God. And I'm trying to say things in the right way to make it happen, but sometimes I just don't even know what I'm supposed to pray for. Right. Sure. I don't know what I'm supposed to say because it's hard to understand what the cooperational relationship with God is. It's hard for all of us. And I remember I just recently reread it in a different book, but you know, there's that famous Mother Teresa quote where she was asked in an interview, when you pray, what do you say to God? And she says, well, mostly I just listen. Mm -hmm. And then he said, and what does God say to you? And she says, well, mostly he just listens too. (laughs) And then the guy said, can you say more about that? And she said, I, I apologize. I don't know another way to explain it. If you don't understand that, I can't explain it in a better way. Mm. And I thought, there's something, it's like good art. There's something that's so true about that that I can't intellectually understand, intellectually explain. Uh, but there, there is a truth to that. There is a level to, often, often prayer for me is just being with God. Psalm 1, yes. which is the very first psalm shouldn't be a shock, but it's one of the only ones that isn't a prayer. It's a really a category. It's it's explaining what the psalms are, and it's this. And I for about six months, I read it every morning and just reread it over and over again. Of being a tree planted in streams of water, that ultimately I become a kind of person that when my relationship with God is just about planting myself with Him and realizing. Often the work God's trying to do in the world is beginning in me. Mm-hmm. And that when I become the kind of person that realizes, um, you know, they call it, uh, there's that book that refers to God as the three mile an hour God, that I'm often moving too fast for oh. what God's trying to do. That three miles an hour is uh, the speed of walking yeah. for most people. That God, we are often at a running pace. And so when you talk about even you pray, and mm-hmm. I may not see God answered in the moment. You may not in the sense of what we think, but that may be because God's working on a longer, 
a lot. I mean, the the key, and we just talked about this now. I guess it, I don't know when this one's coming out. I apologize. I said that before, but four or five weeks before this came out about love being patient and how patience is so critical because I think one big part of it that I didn't get to talk about in the sermon is God is working at a different pace than we are working at. And even in things we talk about racial justice now, we've been talking about that a lot in the church. All, all of us in our world, we have a very impatience with it. I'm not saying that we necessarily should say, Hey, let's just wait. But God has a long arc. You know, Dr. King said that the, what is it, the arc of the... The arc of justice bends slowly, but it bends toward... The arc of human history right. bends slowly, but it bends toward, toward justice. justice. That yeah. it ultimately, everything God is doing is bending towards the kingdom coming to earth. Yes. But it's just been... I mean, we've had 2,000 years to see it's been slow. Mm-hmm. And just in the past 2000, and there's a lot more. To say that we're at the end of the ark, we're, we might be still on the very right. beginning of the ark. Well, we every time know. somebody says to me, our world's worse than it's ever been, I always say to them, that just means you haven't really studied what our world has been like. Yes. Oh, yeah. Our world in almost every way is better than it has ever been. Yes. It just still isn't the way all of us internally know it should be. Sure. It is not where it should be. But to say it's not better, yeah. none of us would survive very long <laughs> in a world that is 300 years ago. No. And, and we back, would all yeah, be yeah. destroyed. And back to your point about prayer just being mostly being with God, I, I think that's pretty um, evident when you read things like Jesus prayed all night long. Right. And I've heard people say, I prayed for three hours, and I, and I say, well, Okay, I believe you, but I guarantee you, you aren't talking the whole time right. no. because right. you ain't got that much to say. Right. Um, and so when if and we want to pray like Jesus, I think Jesus just spent the night in with his father. Mm-hmm. That's pretty much all. And and I've, I was going to say um, part of what we're doing in our discipleship arc right now that I'm in is um, trying to keep an appointment of prayer every day. And mm-hmm. I've I've been using the Lord's prayer just to, mm-hmm. to keep me on that track and a lot of what and I'm and I'm trying to delve into what why did Jesus say those things mm. where this is how you should pray and so I've been dwelling on each of those phrases every mm-hmm. day and a lot of it is just like the first one God make your name great mm-hmm. and so then it leads me to think is God's name great in my world and is there something I can do to make that happen. And I start pondering on that. And that'll lead me off on just these thoughts. Mm-hmm. That's prayer too. Oh yeah. And absolutely. then and then I move on to, you know, your kingdom come, of course. And then every time it's, it always gets me, I'm usually eating breakfast or close to breakfast when give me this day my daily bread. And I and I think to myself, there's never been a day when that didn't happen right. in my life. And so then I get to spend some time just pondering that blessing a grace of God that's been in my life for the whole time. And I suspect it's going to be the whole time too. Mm. I didn't have to pray for it. No. Mm. So my point is just, just going through that little exercise mentally for me has just, it brings me to a place where I'm with him. Mm-hmm. I'm recognizing him. I'm, I'm trying to get into step with what his spirit's doing. And to me, that's as much prayer as the list yeah. that I used to bring to him. And I want to say to the person who wrote this, it's apparent to me from listening to your question, you're a, you're a person that really desires to do what God wants you to do. Yes. You, yeah. you have obedience at the heart of this, mm-hmm. and you're probably way more empathetic than I am because mm-hmm. you have a lot of people mm-hmm. you really care about that you want to do good for. And they say they're carrying guilt over right, that. that you carry yeah. guilt over. What I want to say to you is all of that, your father already knows that mm-hmm. you care about these people. However you bring that to him, whether it's every name or you allow him to lead you to certain names every day, that's okay. Yes. Mm-hmm. It really is okay. It doesn't help that you carry the guilt. And I just want to say this, and I mean this as well as I can on everything, whether it's fasting or it's prayer or whatever, we have a tendency to turn into a religious kind of drill of I have to do it in Mm -hmm. a certain way at a certain time and a certain thing and a certain thing. When I begin to turn things that are about relationships, I'm not saying they shouldn't happen, that you shouldn't do them because that's a part of relationships too. But 
When I'm dealing with an invisible God and I think somehow just doing it the right way, I'm not practicing Christianity. I'm, it's some kind of magic mm-hmm. that I have in my mind. Yeah, mm-hmm. I have some kind of, and I, I wouldn't call it that because that feels, but really that's what it comes down to, that I can somehow make something happen by my sheer ability. I can fast enough, I can mm-hmm. pray enough, I can give enough, I can work enough, and then these good things have to happen. Mm. Well, but think, Jesus clearly says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Mm. So the main job I have in life is to figure out how does prayer help me stay connected to Jesus. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. And let's be clear, if God is love, as the Apostle John tells us he is, that what you just described could not be true. Right. It, it could not be true if God is love, if that, and, and it still has to work that way. Right. That's mm-hmm. right. You know what I mean? No, oh, yeah, I do completely. So, that God somehow will punish my kids because their dad didn't pray often enough for them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I mean, then there's that part that, and I was, you also made me think, you know, of when um, Paul in Romans talks about the, that there are, there are times when we don't know how to pray. Mm-hmm. We don't, and, and you just alluded to that. And then he gives us such a, I love this this verse. Is he says, but then the Holy Spirit prays for us yep. in these groans that cannot be uttered, cannot be understood. I, I lean into that often. I do too. I, I come to God many times, and, and I, don't, I don't know what to say. I don't know how to approach it. I just kind of sit in it for a moment, and I just trust because the Spirit in me is communicating with God yeah. the stuff that I can't communicate. And, and that brings me a lot of peace. And I, and I would say to the person who asked that question, if, if prayer is bringing you more stress, more guilt than before you started praying, you, you need to seriously consider, I, I might be doing it wrong. Right, that's right. Because <laughs> it, it should be a peace-bringing Mm-hmm. exercise, a, a resting that takes place in that, knowing that you're with your Father who is love and is nothing but love for you. Yeah. And it is an exercise. You're going mm-hmm. you're, you're gonna to have to grow in it. We don't know how to do it. Right. That just is the truth. That's right. We don't know how to, we don't know how to, to speak <laughs> the language of it. You know, it's like learning any other language. The only way you learn how to do it is ultimately in conversation. You can mm-hmm. learn you can learn skills and rules and things of that nature, which are helpful. You need to know those things. Mm-hmm. But the best way to learn it is just in, in an immersive, conversational kind of way. And so just just getting into it and stuff like this, asking questions, trying to figure out, find someone you know who you 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 think, oh, they seem to have a prayer life that <laughs> what do you do? What 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 is it that's well, Nathan, know. I think you've said on this podcast many times that you use uh, pre-written prayers many times. Yeah, every day. To I, help guide yeah. you. Because for the sake of, so yeah, I use a, I use a book of common prayer. It's not the Anglican uh, book of common prayer, but it is, it is a book of prayer similar to that. Um, and I didn't say that to say that you should, if you want to no. use the Anglican book of prayer, use the Anglican uh, common book, but mine is it's just a different one. And uh, it's very helpful to me. Uh, it uses a lot of different traditions that I'm not used to. And so it forces m- my imagination to open up to different areas. And that's one thing I think prayer does that is different than other forms of spiritual formation is when I pray using other people's words, using biblical words, using Jesus's words. My, if what you just talked about, when you talked about the Lord's prayer, it's an, it's an, it's, it's, uh, it's stretching of the imagination. It's opening my mind. Cause even when you say, you know, Lord, may your name be great. Or often when I pray, I pray the Lord's prayer every morning as well. When I pray it, I say, may your name be cherished, or I'll mm-hmm. even just change certain words to try and stretch my imagination. What does it even mean for God's name to be made great? Mm-hmm. Cause that doesn't mean anything to me. When yeah. you say, Nathan, may your name be great. I'm like, I don't know what that, <laughs> if you were going to make my name great. So you know what I mean? I've got to stretch my imagination. That's something Jesus wants to happen in the world, that God's name would be yep. uh, would be holy or would be cherished or would be great or famous or all these different words. What does that mean? What does it mean to trust God, give me today my daily bread? What is something? Because like you said, that's always happened for me. Yep. But is there more to it than that? And it, all of that stretches my imagination to see the world the way Jesus did. And if I could see the world the way Jesus did, which is that my father's always at work, mm-hmm. then I could actually join him. Too often we are jumping into things that we think are good and godly and God's saying, I'm not even doing that. 
Why are you asking me to come over there and bless what you're doing? Because you think, oh, what God really wants me to do, right? God, God wants for there to be more disciples of Jesus. So what that means is I need to just go jump people in the middle of a parking lot and start yelling at them about mm-hmm. Jesus. God, come bless this. And I prayed about it beforehand. Why is that not working? And God may be going, I'm not, I'm not working over there. I just saw somebody just yesterday, in fact, on the road that I drive home, and I thought this is obviously a very godly, committed person holding up a sign with a verse of Scripture written on it that I caught the first words, and because I know the Scripture, I knew the rest of the verse. And if you don't know the Scripture, the sign was written with too many words on it for anybody to read at highway speed. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Do you know what I mean? I do. And this, I thought, this is a really good person trying to do what they think God wants them to do, and somebody has not helped them get a better method. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I, thought, I mean, they have all the right stuff. They've just been pointed in the in the wrong direction. Yeah. Well, and everyone I think can relate to this, or maybe this is just my kids, but anyone I should say who's a parent can relate to this experience. Uh, one thing we did on our week off was I, I last year, like a lot of people, we started a quarantine garden, so I, I'm getting my garden ready, and so we're planting stuff, and it took a little while because this is the this is the first you know crops of the year, so I'm going, I have to do a lot to the soil, so I'm preparing the soil, and I'm doing stuff, and I'm putting the plants in, and one of my daughters comes over and goes. Um, can I help you? And I said, yes, you can help me. So she's sitting with me and she, and she's doing what I do in prayer. She honestly, it's just, she just wants to be with dad. Yeah. She just wants, and occasionally I'll say, go get me that plant. Nope, not that plant. Go get, nope, wrong one, you know, but it's very cooperational. I have three other daughters who are playing the whole time. They keep coming over and getting frustrated because they keep wanting to be. And I say, if you're going to come help me, you can be here right now. But if you just want to play and start kicking things over, which is what they were doing, you're going to have to go somewhere else, right? And then they keep getting mad. Well, Daddy, I want to play, and you don't want to come play with me. And I'm going, because that's not the work I'm doing right now. (laughs) The work I'm doing right now is planning this. I get you have an agenda that you want me to come bless but that's not what I'm doing. Your sister over here is doing what I'm doing. If you want to be with me, I want you to be with me, but come be with me. Don't come over. Don't go somewhere and go now. Now I'm going to stand in the middle of the road and dad's going to have to come save me. Yeah. Yeah, That's a great illustration. Mm -hmm. I had a a follow-up conversation to a thing we had a few weeks ago where somebody said, you know, the world's a perfectly safe place. Explain Mm -hmm. that to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And whether it's the person or a different person who talked to me personally about that, uh, on uh, in person, uh, they said, you know, I have been places where it's obvious I wasn't safe, that people are around me, security guards do. And those, so saying that doesn't make sense to me because my life is in danger. And I said, I get it, but because you think God's highest agenda is your, your life, life. You, you're missing what it is. God is, not, yeah. God is interested in you. And you will continue long after your life Mm -hmm. is over. And you, in the hands of God, is always in a safe place. Mm -hmm. And if we've truly done what Jesus instructed us to do, to give up our lives, to lose your life, you gain the life that you never knew you had. So we spend a lot of time, I think, trying to get God to use your illustration I feel like my life is in danger, and God's going, I'm not really doing your yeah. life on this planet is not what I'm doing. If you want to get on board with me, you may have to give up your life. Mm-hmm. You, I, I heard someone, I can't even remember who said this. He had a British accent. That's what I have in my head. It's probably N.T. right then. I heard this <laughs> in a British accent. I think it's somebody else, but I can't remember the guys. I think it's that Australian guy, that uh, the Mr. Cultural Moment guy. Well, then it wouldn't oh, have been a yeah. British accent. You know, yeah. well, uh, Mark Australia? Sayers. Everybody that's not Southern. Is <laughs> <laughs> Australian people. <laughs> you know. They, it's, it's, it's closer they, to British. They yeah. sounded fancy. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know sure enough. They sounded fancy. Uh, said, I spent a lot of time praying prayers to God as if I was the CEO. Mm. And when I finally understood, oh, God's the one actually in charge of everything. I'm cooperating with him, not getting him to cooperate with me. Mm-hmm. Yep. And that's what prayer is really about, is me getting mm-hmm. to the place where I say, to you, your will be done. Mm-hmm. You know, Lead me not into temptation. Mm-hmm. Deliver me from evil. But you know, sometimes evil has a temporary victory. It did yep. over mm-hmm. Jesus. Friday was a temporary evil victory, they thought. Well, and the truth is, we, we are delivered from evil 
ultimately. Yes, that's right. Yes. No matter how many of those little victories, it, it wins. That's we, right. We have been delivered. That's right. That, we'll be, that really is what that part of that prayer right. is about. Yes. Well, and because ultimately where it comes to is the thing you've talked about is my life is hidden with Christ. Right. If I have done what you said, I've died to myself and said, these things I think are my life. That's the whole point of it being the safest place is your heartbeat might be in danger, but your life is not in danger. Yeah. That your life is more than the physical processes happening in your... That's one of my all-time favorite um, verses that I put to memory is uh, Christ, that part, your life is hidden with God in Christ. And then when Christ, who is your life, right. Right. is revealed. That's right. See, there, there's... So a, Christ is never in danger. Therefore, no. you... What ma- I mean, everyone gets that. I mean, I know that sounds kind of like we're being silly saying like heartbeat versus your life, but you get that because you would say, you say those kind of things to your kids of, you're my heart. You don't mean they're literally your heartbeat. You would even say, I've heard many people say, you're my life. My family is my life. What you're saying is, my life is more than just physically what happens Well, and people me. even get it that people that they care about whose heartbeat has stopped. I hear people all the time mm-hmm. say, I still talk to my mom every day. I mm-hmm. still connect. You know, I still feel very connected. I, you know, they, mm-hmm. they aren't gone. They're still with me. Right. And, and they're not talking figuratively. No. They, they yeah. still sense a connection. Yes. Because it's, it's real. So when Jesus says, if I try to hold on to my life, which means I define my life. Yes. So me having this house and this car and these people and all of this and this experience, this is my life. He said, everybody that tries to hold on to that, they're going to lose that. Mm-hmm. But if you let go of this, you can have life. Mm-hmm. Life is available because life is is Christ. Yes. You can have this. Yes. You can't have everything, but you can have Jesus. Yeah. Yes. Well, and ultimately, when you talk about prayers in the morning, that's a prayer I regularly pray through is the things that I would pray, God, do this, do this, is I, I used to over and over and say, I release this. I release this to you. I know that you know what's better. I'm going to pray some stuff for my kids that I want, which I'm not saying is wrong. I regularly do that. I say, hey, God, Mm -hmm. these are things that I think this one of my daughters needs, and this is one thing I think this, but often when I pray is I go, God, I know I'm just going to trust you already know what they need better than I, and what I think they need may not be what they need. So I release that to you. I release my job to you. I release my my family. I release all these things trusting that your will, may your will be done because it's going to be better than my will. And mm-hmm. I just trust that. I think that's a part of all of this, that prayer is a chance every day for me to get back in line. What is God doing in the world? And because ultimately it's daily bread. It's yeah. every yeah. day. That's a great place to end that discussion. All right. So um, we are coming up on Easter, which yep. is this Sunday. So uh, hopefully everybody's making plans to attend either online or in person. Yep. Yes, so, Easter4Coweta.com is yep. where you can, uh, if, if you were in person, you've already hopefully gotten your invite cards that you hopefully. can yep. share with people. Or if you're online, you can share Easter4Coweta.com with people. It'll take them where they can either get the location to go online mm-hmm. and join us online or to, to reserve tickets because you still got to get tickets. So if you're coming in person, you're yes. going to need to let us know and you need to let us know they're coming because it'll be a better experience for them if they show up with tickets. As always, we try to do our best for everybody, mm-hmm. but it is a much better experience that they don't show up embarrassed that they do not have tickets and they yeah, may have they, to wait. They feel and, bad. We, we always do our best to make everybody feel welcome, but they can see, oh, there was a hiccup. And you there will, you will feel frustrated or embarrassed or guilty if you show up with them and you did not tell them to get tickets. Or you, if I were you, I would get tickets for them. Yes. I would ask them to come. If when they say they're coming, you get tickets for them, them, especially if they're coming with kids. Pick them up. And if they're coming with chocolate. kids, remember, if you're coming with kids, either one this Sunday. You can come at nine. Oh, yeah. That's right. Or, or um, nine thirty or eleven. But I do really want to encourage you. Honestly, the kids' tickets are more important mm-hmm. to make sure oh, that yeah. you have those because we have we have stricter regulations on how many kids we can have per adults and all of these different. Well, we don't have a giant room that used to seat five hundred that we put all the kids in. Yeah. Right. So we have we have less space. So we have to have we we want everybody wants their kids to be safe. We want every kid to be safe. Well, and we want to have enough supplies for them and right. to be ready for them and to have them in the right class with their age group. You want all of these things for your for for your visitor. We want it for them. So make sure you go to Easter for Coweta. Get get them tickets. And- Absolutely. Yep. 
And don't forget, keep sending us questions. We will keep on answering them. Yep. Uh, the link is in the description. Uh, you can leave it, the question anonymously or tell us who you are, and we'll talk to you directly. Exactly. All right. So we'll see you on Easter. It's going to be a great weekend. And we'll, uh, we'll see you right back here next week. All right. Bye.